Welcome back everyone to Clinician's Brief, the podcast, where we bring you in-depth conversations with the experts behind all of your favorite Clinician's Brief content. I'm the host of this program, Dr. Alyssa Watson, and today I am delighted to welcome Dr. Mark Seitz, an accomplished author and the recipient of the Zoetis Distinguished Veterinary Teaching Award. He's making his first appearance on today's podcast, but he has been on some other podcasts before, so I'm excited for this conversation today. Our focus is going to revolve around a really critical aspect in general practice, and that is the utilization of radiography as well as ultrasonography when we're trying to identify gastrointestinal foreign bodies. Um, Dr. Seitz is an associate clinical professor of diagnostic imaging at Mississippi State University, so I don't think there's really anyone better to guide us through this conversation. How are you doing today, Dr. Seitz? Thank you so much for coming on the program. Oh, Alyssa, I am delightful today. I am down in Mississippi, so we're already into shorts weather, at least this week, and uh, we're just enjoying it. Mm-hmm. I am in Vegas, and so also the it, we're definitely moving into our spring season and it's nice to to be outside in shorts and a t-shirt again so (laughs) it is thank you groundhog (laughs) (laughs) so um we have a ton to talk about today but before we do that if you could just give us just a quick bio um introduce yourself to the audience I would love to. So I am proud to be a Bulldog. I graduated from Mississippi State in 2007. And afterwards, I honestly had aspirations of practice ownership and going into private practice. So I worked um, with some phenomenal colleagues in Atlanta, Georgia for three years in GP, but I was also... um, dabbling my toe in the emergency waters and the emergency bug bit me bad when we moved up to Philadelphia or the greater Philly area for my wife to go to grad school. I decided to give full-time ER a try and oh my goodness, it was such a great fit for me. I am a bit of a sensation seeker. As my wife has pointed out, I love adrenaline. And so it was just wonderful. The caseload, the people uh, loved it. And all that time I was doing tons of ultrasound. Obviously, You know, obstructions are something we see a lot in both GP and ER, but because of that ultrasound theme, as my ER career continued, it took me about 10 full years, but I finally embraced the dark side and realized, you know what, diagnostic imaging has all the things I love about ER just compressed, and I actually got to embrace other loves like physics, and uh, after taking a little bit of a career risk and doing a mid-career residency, I'm now uh, a boarded radiologist, but when I write and teach, I try to write and teach from the perspective of the caseload that I experienced, and I try to deliver things that you know I wanted and would have helped me out when I was on the clinic floor. I absolutely love that. And, you know, it's one of the things that we try to do at Clinician's Brief as well, you know, bring this really practical approach to these things that you're seeing in GP all the time. And I'm in general practice. And so, um, you know, when I was getting ready for this episode, I was really kind of reflecting on my career. Uh, I was a little bit ahead of you, not, not too far, but I graduated in 2003 from Iowa State. And I, um, Back then, I mean, we didn't really have digital radiography, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) so I I wasn't dipping films, you know, we had a machine that processed them at least, but, uh, you know, there has been just this huge shift in, um, you know, in my practice career, well, I've been practicing about the speed with which you can take x-rays and being able to, you know, digitally send them someplace else to have someone else, you know, look at them. Um, And that has been a real game changer. But I love the fact that you are so passionate about about having people, you know, look and interpret at their their own films, because Mm -hmm. I think that that is a huge skill that I do not want to see lost. Um, And so why do you think everybody should be able to do this? Everybody should be able to look at an, an abdominal radiograph and evaluate it, you know, for signs of obstruction. Yeah. So I'll start with the heart. I think at the heart, I don't want to see the role that general practitioner change in veterinary medicine. It's one of the things I'm proud of. And I guess what I'm hinting at, when we look at the human model, things have gotten very fractured. And I think that art of taking care of the patient as a whole patient gets lost. And so my my main motivation is actually, I love in veterinary medicine that general practitioners, and this is a guideline I give students, are empowered to treat 
diagnose and treat 80%, 90% of what walks in their door. And so as my imaging part of that, I tell my students flat out, my goal is that you can leave here and not need me 80%, 90% of the time and only come get me when it's really challenging. And then we both get to have some fun. Um, What I don't want is to create students and veterinarians who are dependent on me because honestly there are not enough radiologists to go around and telemedicine's on a huge backlog so the the more important though part is we've got a patient in front of us and that patient especially for some of these more emergent things needs intervention and we know the sooner we intervene and fix them the better the outcome so if i can train vets who are already out as well as students to be self-sufficient, everybody benefits. They feel good. The pet gets better faster. Less money is spent hospitalizing um, rather than you send it out. And yeah, there might be a stat read in a few hours, but you're waiting. Or maybe it's a few days and you're waiting. So I, I think it benefits us, the patient, uh, and just keeps a case moving forward. Yeah. I think, and we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, radiographic signs, as well as some tricks and hacks we can do with positioning, um, you know, as well as some of these radiographic techniques. But also, I think just knowing when you need to do those, being able to look at the film and say, oh, it would really benefit me to take a different view here, um, Mm -hmm. you know, because I've seen that happen in general practice where, like you said, you take the x-rays, you send them out. And then several hours later or the next day, you get something back from a radiologist that says, oh, I really would have liked to have this view or wouldn't it have been great Mm -hmm. if you had done a contrast study. So, right. Right. I agree. So now that we have established why this is such a really important diagnostic skill, um, let's talk a little bit about abdominal radiographs when you suspect a GI foreign body. So um, there are definitely other causes of of mechanical obstruction. Um, So what what other conditions, you know, besides GI foreign bodies can can cause obstruction, either mechanical or functional um, of the GI tract? Yeah, that's a great question. So by and large, foreign body is the most common. And for me, my brain is such that I like to compartmentalize because it helps me remember detail. So when I think about this, it's probably like a lot of us were taught or a lot of us think about it. But if we think of the GI tract like plumbing, you can clog the pipe up, you can make the pipe thicker, or you can compress the pipe. And so when we look at causes, the main intraluminal causes, you know, plugging the pipe are going to be foreign bodies, um, potentially a mass growing into the lumen, and then intussusceptions. Uh, Trichobezoars, I kind of think of like a foreign body, but some people consider that separate. Uh, Those would be intraluminal causes. When we think of mural, we get into, unfortunately, infiltrative diseases. We think of uh, infectious diseases. Down in the south, we see a lot of fungal disease and pythium. Um, And then, unfortunately, cancer as patients get older. And we can have cancers that grow completely mural and compress or grow a mass off of and destroys wall layering, clogs stuff up. And then finally, least common are going to be that extra luminal compression. But again, in the South, we see a lot of trauma. So the one thing I see probably most often is bowel getting entrapped uh, through a hernia of some sort uh, or even entrapped inside, like through a mesenteric rent or around a GDV site or something of that nature. So granted, there are zebras out there in the sense that much less common, but those are the common things that we see on the clinic floor, and I'd say of those, foreign bodies and susceptions and uh, infiltrative disease, cancer and infections are going to be most common. Okay. You do recommend three view abdominal survey films, um, you know, and this is something that's also changed a little bit over my career. We, we always did two view. And then I remember uh, when we were starting to talk about, oh, from, you know, a met check in the thorax, you really need that third view. But now I think it's really standard to do these three view abdominal rads as well. But you had mentioned something um, in the article that I hadn't heard before and that it's actually the order that you take them in is important. Could you expand on that a little bit? 
Yeah. So what I'd like to stress is that at the end of the day, let's get some reds. And, uh, you know, a paramount importance is that left lateral projection. Um, that's going to be, by and large, our, our most important projection when evaluating for a foreign body. In fact, I'm so passionate about that. When you look at all the things we could be looking for in RADs, there's only a single condition that's common that would necessitate a right lateral, and that's a GDV. GDV. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I recommend three view, but if you're in a clinic that still unfortunately charges for two view, uh, swap your left in for your right. Um, now, getting directly into your question, the order, I am in the camp that I want to see gas go into as many places as I can that a foreign body could live. And the reason for that, gas is this free negative contrast agent that can outline foreign bodies that might otherwise be invisible and blending in with the fluid and food that's in our intestines. So for example, in that left lateral, gas goes into the pylorus, you can see a pyloric outflow obstruction. But if you start with that left lateral, and then you move them into VD, you've trapped gas in the pylorus, it then moves into the duodenum, and then in right lateral, it goes even more toward the duodenum. What you do in about 70% of these dogs is you force gas into the duodenum, and it won't be a lot, but you'll see this little gas stripe on your VD going down the body wall, and even on your lateral, you can now see where the duodenum's located. And I find this as a huge advantage because one, you know where it is, and two, if there's a foreign body, it will kind of outline it and form a meniscus sign of sort, or at least outline some margin, outline some margin of it. And if there's no foreign body, you have the comfort of saying, all right, I definitively see an empty pylorus. I definitively see gas in the duodenum. I know there's no foreign body there. And you get to check that off your list. Excellent. Yeah. I love using things that are free. <laughs> yes, I do too. <laughs> So there are kind of three really common patterns um, that we will see with obstructive foreign bodies. Can you can you walk us through those? Absolutely. So when when we're looking at what to look for in radiographs, I very much take a checklist approach. Um, I come from a background where checklists were very emphasized. Um, aviation. I was the the idiot jumping out of the planes. I didn't fly them, but um, checklists keep us safe. And I find I bring that into my imaging and in that you, you of course, want to look at RADS and get this global perspective and not miss anything and read the whole film. But studies have actually shown you're more accurate if you look at your RADS with a clinical question. So very much if you palpate something abnormal and there's painful bowel and it's a two-year-old lab, it's okay to say, is there an obstruction here and do I see a foreign body? So now when we look at our RADs, there are three obstructions and they create these three distinct patterns and granted more than one can occur at a time. But the first pattern is a pyloric obstruction. Something gets lodged in the pylorus. With that, we will see gastric dilation that varies in size. All right. And ideally, we're looking for the foreign body itself inside the pylorus. The second is going to be a small bowel obstruction characterized by that segmental dilation that we talk about, two populations of bowel, where something's stuck in the small bowel, so what's behind it or ORAD gets dilated with gas and fluid, or, and then beyond that, toward the colon is normal. And then the third is going to be that dreaded linear foreign body, which uh, I will give you is tough to diagnose sometimes, but we're looking for that bowel to plicate like we know it does. So pyloric obstruction, small bowel obstruction, plication, and then occasionally you're unlucky enough it anchors in the pylorus causing an obstruction with linear foreign body, right? So you can start to combine them a little bit. Sure. How does the degree, like partial versus a full obstruction or the chronicity, how long it's it's been going on, affect those radiographic signs that we're going to see? That is a great question. A lot, actually. So let's let's compare and contrast acute versus chronic and look at it in the various places. With an acute obstruction, sometimes stuff hasn't had enough time to dilate. So if it's per acute, like a couple hours, the, the pattern can be deceptively normal, especially pyloric obstructions. A lot of times I've seen a foreign body watch in the pylorus and the stomach is completely normal. So we actually coach our students, you can't use a normal stomach size to rule out a pyloric obstruction. You have to look in that pylorus. Same thing, if you do have gastric dilation and that animal vomits, 
they evacuate that gas and fluid, and so it may reduce the stomach back to its normal size. Specific to the stomach, with acute obstructions, they tend to be gas dilated. Um, with chronic, they tend to be fluid dilated. The small bowel, that doesn't really apply, unfortunately. And then, of course, with acute or linear foreign body friends, it just may not have had enough time to placate yet. So now we go to chronic. We kind of hinted the big thing with chronic, when you have a chronic obstruction of the stomach, you'll get fluid dilation. You'll also sometimes get this fun little sign called a gravel sign where food isn't getting out and it starts to solidify and mineralize and you get this mineral opaque granular or gravel looking material at the pyloric outflow track. We can see this with small bowel obstructions too, especially with neoplasms that grow really uh, slow because you start getting food stuck there, but some stuff is getting by and it just starts to pack in and solidify and it's really gross. Curiously, with small bowel obstructions, other than the size of them, there really uh, isn't a good fluid versus gas difference between them. So chronic small bowel obstructions can be a little bit challenging sometimes. Okay. And then how useful do you really feel like those, when we're talking about those small bowel obstructions, um, when, how useful do you feel those ratio calculations are? You know, I've seen them been taught the intestinal <laughs> yep. diameter, compare it to the vertebra. And, and it seems like I've seen a couple different formulas over the years. <laughs> Yeah. So this is what's really fun. We're we're in this really fun realm in radiology, if I can give a global perspective. If you can think of something in the body, we figured out a way as radiologists to measure it, and we've done a study on it. All right. So to be fair, because there's been some good studies, when you look at the multiple, and I mean over half a dozen studies measuring bowel in various ways, they they are decently accurate, depending on where you put your cutoff and sensitivity and specificity for diagnosing obstruction or ruling it out. What's really interesting though, um, a phenomenal author did a meta-analysis of every measurement, and I won't quote the exact numbers, but in short, the majority of measurements we measure in radiology did not increase the accuracy of the person reading and making the diagnosis. So the way I kind of teach it to students is, all right, we're going to teach you this. It's a tool. But at the end of the day, your, your ability as a doctor to look at the history, the exam, your radiographs, and make a call is most of the time as accurate, if not more accurate, than a single number that you measure on the screen. Um, it, it just so... Me personally, as a radiologist, rarely use them. I'll occasionally use them to teach a student or prove a point. Um, but most of the time, I look at it, make my call, and move on. Um, and there, there's been some significant evidence to demonstrate we are actually as accurate, if not more. Or said another way, the numbers don't make us more accurate. Sure. Absolutely. That's some very good advice. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Let's move on and discuss a couple of those techniques we kind of hinted at earlier, mm -hmm. because these, um, you know, looking back, I've even had some cases recently where I was like, gosh, I wish I would have thought to do that, especially when mm -hmm. we're talking about free air. <laughs> and yeah. so can you yeah. talk a little bit um, about, you know, a technique like um, a pneumocolonography? Um, yeah. How is that performed? What clinical mm -hmm. scenarios would you be using that for? Oh, I love it. it. It's actually one of my favorite little MacGyver hacks. This goes in the MacGyver medicine. You can charge as as little or as much as you want for the technique. So when we look at kind of the, the old-fashioned radiology way, we would, uh, you know, distend it a whole lot, uh, do a barium enema, yada, yada, yada. Let's put that aside for a minute. So when would you do a pneumoclonogram? The primary indication to do it is when you have either seen a foreign body and you can't tell if it's in the small bowel or colon, or if you've seen a dilated loop and you're trying to decide is that loop colon slash cecum, or am I dealing with segmental small bowel dilation that would support going in? Because we got to remember, we don't always have to see the foreign body to get a green light to cut. If I have segmental dilation that is indicative of an obstruction, I'm telling a surgeon to go in. Or when I was in private practice, it was me going in. I didn't have to see the foreign body. So uh, I've had a lot of fun cases where there's a rock on the left side of the abdomen on your VD, and you play the game, is this in descending colon, or is the rock in small bowel? One will pass, the other needs cut. Or same thing, is that real gas dilated loop cecum 
or is it small bowel? So what we would do is take a red rubber catheter um, and base it based on the size of the dog. Bigger is always better. Um, lubricate it. Uh, we're going to insert it and we're going to give about one to three. I usually start at three, three mil per keg of air. I've seen people report doses up to 20 mil per keg. Do not use this dose. It will overfill the bell and create segmental dilation, which is what we're looking for. Now, by starting at three, you may need to repeat it a couple times, but I'd much rather you serial, serially uh, fill the bell, fill the colon, than accidentally fill half the jejunum and then you can't take it out of the animal. So you're going to insert your red rubber. Usually they don't need sedation, but you can always give a little bit of tor, valium, et cetera. You're going to inject free air. All right. Doesn't have to be sterile. It's going into the colon and then remove hands out of the beam and immediately take your film, take your lateral, take your VD. You're then going to look, if you can see gas going up the colon all the way around to the cecum, then you're done. The study's done. If the gas goes halfway up and you haven't filled it all, then repeat it until you get the effect. The goal is to fill gas to the cecum. Um, by doing that, you'll now know definitively where colon is and you'll be able to see if a form body is in it or is that bowel loop small bowel or is it colon if that the weird loop went away then it was probably colon cecum okay yeah and you actually preemptively answered one of my questions because i have also seen um mm -hmm. uh references where they're using yeah four times as much air as that and so it this is in order to get you know, a better indication of where the colon is, not so much because mm -hmm. more air is going to be dangerous to the patient, right? No, no, that's just it. it the big the big thing is inconvenience. I, I've seen people get away with that amount, but I've also seen them overfill and give segmental dilation. Mm -hmm. And then they're sitting there going, oh my gosh, I've gas dilated a small bowel. If you want to split the difference, you could start with five. You know, I don't see a lot of patients get overfilled with five. Uh, that would be reasonable to do as well. Five mil per kg of just gas. And then one one tip, I actually, yeah, of just air. I love to leave the red rubber catheter in because sometimes they um, pass gas, pass the gas back out. And um, at least if the red rubber is in there, you know how far it's in, you can see at least that portion of the colon. Uh, so it's just a little pro tip as well. Excellent. We love those little pearls. So Yeah. <laughs> So let's talk about um, a pneumogastrogram. Um, so yeah. this is something where, yeah, this was really, really neat. Um, so the describe this for our audience. I've never done this. Um, yeah. I, I'm waiting for a case to use it on now, and I'm, I've got my carbonated beverage. I'm gonna. Do you have liquid death in Mississippi? <laughs> Wait, what? what is liquid death? I'm not familiar with this term. <laughs> it, it's just carbonated water. They sell it. So I'm in Vegas. They sell it all oh, over okay. in Vegas. And it looks like it should be some horrible alcoholic beverage, but it's just carbonated water. <laughs> Oh, that's really funny. I'm sure we have it. I'm a pretty vanilla guy sometimes. So I've got my official 40 ounce of just tap water. So, uh, but no, we probably do. So you could use that. But um, where this technique yeah. comes in handy is if you go to take your left lateral projection and there's insufficient gas in the stomach to outline the pylorus, you you may have suspicion of pyloric outflow tract obstruction. And you want to fill it up to see if you can see a foreign body. Um and so I actually want to give a shout out to, uh, I first learned about this technique, not as a radiologist. I learned it my first year in private practice from my first boss. And she came to me and said, hey, we're going to do this on this patient. And I looked at her like she had three heads. And I'm like, what? What? And I didn't know it looking back. She had she was up to date with the literature because the article is from Jaha and she always read the literature and um, she was just practicing up to date medicine. So historically, we've done pneumogastrograms by sedating the patient, placing a tube and instilling 10 to 20 mil per keg of air. But to a general practitioner, that's a lot. To an owner, that's a lot. Um, you may even have to intubate them to do that, you know, to protect from reflux. So what somebody geniusly figured out, what do you do when you drink a soda often? You burp. So we're going to use the power of carbonation, and we're going to feed carbonated beverage 
Um, and it's funny, the doses that's reported isn't per body weight. It's just, I think, 60 mils. Not all animals take that. So I kind of say 30 to 60, maybe 30 for smaller, 60 for bigger. And you're going to get it in the dog much the way you would give charcoal. And what I mean by that, if you put charcoal in front of a golden retriever, they're going to lap it up. Chihuahua, they're not going to eat the most delicious steak sandwich in the world. You have to like feed it to them, right? So um, however you would give charcoal. That's how you want to get it in. Um, people ask me, oh, do you ever like tube it? I mean, you can, but I just, I try to avoid that if I can, um, but either syringe it in or let them lap it up. But as soon as they drink that carbonated beverage, make certain it's not caffeinated, right? So we're looking Sprite seven up or the water you, you listed. Liquid um, death. <laughs> as soon as liquid death, get it in them and then immediately put them in left lateral and take a radiograph. You can then turn them in VD and take it. If there wasn't enough, repeat it. Um, it I won't you know, pass it off as magic. There are times it doesn't work, but there are times it's actually made the difference of me sending the animal to scope to surgery versus saying, nope, we're fine and never having to go on to ultrasound, which I love ultrasound, but if I can save that money toward treatment, I feel like I've done the owner a better service. Excellent. Yeah. It's really neat trick. I can't wait to use it. I have used mm -hmm. when, where I've used carbonated beverages is I have used them a couple times to unclog like a gastroesophageal tube um, yeah. that has gotten yeah. clogged and that, that bubble for some reason helps, helps clear that tube. So, but I'm excited to try it. For exactly. This. Oh, no, what I was going to say, hopefully what I, I hope people are here, and we'll talk about the last one, but I am a huge fan of maximizing diagnostic yield. And so for all these, like at state, we include these as part of the original study. But if you need to, you charge 50, 100, whatever, but you're still far cheaper than an ultrasound. And I, I really do feel people are forgetting how helpful radiographs can be. And, you know, I've made the point, I would say the majority of our obstructions at state are made on rads. And I really don't think it's just because we're radiologists. It's because we've got all these tips and tricks we pull out. And if we need to ultrasound, sure. But most of the time we can look at the rads and move on with our life. It's, it's wonderful. And that's what I like to empower vets to do. It's not everybody has ultrasound. We can talk about ultrasound and I love it, but man, maximize your rads. They're wonderful, especially with digital radiography. Yeah. Right. Yep. And, and we will talk about ultrasound today after the break, but last thing before we do go to break, uh, compression yep. radiography. Um, so this is one, this is yep. one that I do have a range of wooden spoons and spatulas sitting, you know, in, mm -hmm. in my radiology department. So. Yep. I love it. I love it. So yeah, this is going to be a technique. Wood compression is going to be a technique when you're looking at your bowel and you see bowel collected together, bunching, possibly plicated. And what we're trying to differentiate in really obese animals or sometimes just normal cats, they, they love to do this. They will just naturally, their bowel will lay in the right lateral abdomen. And you look at them and you think, why is that happening? And so you're trying to differentiate, is there a linear foreign body or is this normal bunching? When that is the case, you pull out your wood spoon. And like you, we, we have several, we break them every once in a while, but you're going to take a wooden spoon and the key is it has to be wooden. I've unfortunately, I don't know if you've done this, I've seen people grab metal and then you can't see anything. So wood spoon and with a leaded uh, you want to wear your lead uh, because you're now touching the patient, getting scatter radiation. You're going to push down at the spot where the bell's collecting. It's usually mid-abdomen. And you're just going to have somebody push down with hand out of the primary beam, but with a lead glove holding, and then make your exposure. The, the x-rays are able to pass through the wood. You'll see a little outline of it, but what it's going to do is push the bell away. So if the bell is free to move and it's normal, it pushes out of the way. But if there's a plicated linear foreign body, especially at the duodenum, the plications will stay there and they'll be right under the wooden spoon. And you're going to do this in both a lateral and VD. Even though it's not the topic, it's also very useful for pyometras, for pushing lightly, and I mean lightly, in the caudal abdomen so you don't rupture the pyo, to displace the small bowel cranially so that you can see the dilated tubes go in the, you know, uterine body and uh, the uterine horns going to that space between colon and urinary bladder. That's another great tip. Thank you. You're welcome.
The road to treatment isn't always as clear as we'd like. Having a trusted reference on hand can make a difference, especially on your busiest days. The Clinician's Brief Algorithm Collection can help quickly guide you to your most confident diagnosis. With more than 100 management trees to reference, you can navigate your rule-outs, eliminate differentials, and choose your next steps. Get the Clinician's Brief Algorithm Collection at cliniciansbrief.com algorithms. Okay, we're back from our break. Let's switch gears a little bit and let's go ahead and talk about ulcer sonography um, because there was a, uh, in your article, there was a sentence that I found a little bit surprising. Um, you said that ultrasonography can diagnose small intestinal mechanical obstruction with greater accuracy than radiography. But we just finished saying that you generally uh, diagnose most of your foreign bodies with radi radiography. So can you clarify that statement a little bit? Are you talking about only uh, boarded radiologists such as yourself or, you know, talk us talk us through that statement a little bit more? Absolutely. So this is where I think it's important to know what we're studying when we study and report these results. All right. So the this the the couple studies that have been done and there have been several um they have absolutely established that ultrasound is more accurate for diagnosing small bowel obstructions and linear foreign bodies than than radiography and i think already we need to recognize the terminology we used i did not say pyloric obstruction i said small bowel and linear foreign body okay and the other is we have to recognize, depending on the study done, some of them are going to have a selection bias. Oftentimes, the ones going on to ultrasound are harder ones that were equivocal on reds. Now, there have been some studies that have said, nope, we're going to do both on everything. And those are a little bit better to look at. But also, a lot of them are done in academia, and those are usually going to be more challenging cases that a GP maybe did not address. So there, there's all sorts there. So the perspective I think we have to take when that animal comes in, we don't know if they're obstructed or not. And if they have a very obvious metal or mineral foreign body, boom, it's off the table. You're going to see it immediately. So I love rats first for several reasons. One, if there's a foreign body there that's metal or mineral or gas opaque, even ping pong balls show up great, you're going to see it. You're done. You know there's a foreign body there. Now you're just matching the pattern with it. The, the second thing is that gas is the enemy of ultrasound. And so in those dogs that are really obstructed, I mean, severe pyloric obstruction, that's really gas dilated, you're actually often going to see that easier on rads than you ever will on ultrasound. Because when you look at a stomach with ultrasound, you see that near field border, that wall, and then it shadows and you see nothing underneath. And so I've seen instances where foreign bodies and gastric masses were missed on ultrasound that were very, very obvious to see on radiographs. So on one hand, yes, ultrasound is more accurate for small bowel stuff because it's easier to get to and see. But on the other hand, a dog doesn't come in with a post-it note that says, I have a small bowel obstruction. It just comes in vomiting and you don't know, is it not obstructed? Is it a big tumor? Is it a GDV? Is it septic peritonitis? Is it a gastric pyloric outflow obstruction? Is it linear? So because of that, just vast array of what it could be, you start with your rads and move on, but you move on with confidence that if radiographs don't answer that question, which they do 70% of the time, if they don't answer the question, you're in that 30% of patients, ultrasound is a better next step that's probably going to yield you an answer because for small bowel, it's like 97% accurate. But notice I didn't say 100. One out of 30 patients, you will make the wrong call, and that's a boarded radiologist. It's a little scary to think about it in that way, but if you see if I'm not obstructions, you're still going to have a negative explore. Yeah. I think uh, when I was in school, they said, if you don't have a negative explore once in a while, you're not doing enough of them. So, but that was before we had all these other wonderful imaging modalities. Yeah. Yeah. But Alyssa, 
to to jump on that. I still agree with that. I do hear sometimes young surgeons, residents, doctors say, oh, with all this technology, you should never have a negative explore. And I want to remind people of some seminal studies that when when you look at how much ultrasound and surgery agree, or let me look at it another way, disagree, they will disagree about 25% of the time. And the the tissues most likely to be wrong are GI tract and liver. Like we have to recognize the limitations of ultrasound. So from that perspective, I, I truly believe surgery is the most accurate diagnostic test we have. And oh, by the way, it's treatment. So if we're looking at our ultrasound and it's not giving us the answer we think, but the patient is screaming, cut me, sometimes you just need to cut them and get in there. Absolutely. And I thank you for that. And I think it's great advice, yeah. you know, to a lot of, um, especially, you know, uh, newer grads or maybe somebody that's never had a negative explore. I have definitely had mm -hmm. a few negative explores in my career and, yeah. and Me yeah, too. sometimes they're just necessary. Yeah. So, um, Let's talk a little bit. So I sometimes get confused about all the different terms there are out there, right. like point of care ultrasound and, and fast scans and focused scans. And can you just describe your technique when you're performing a point of care ultrasound on the GI tract? Yeah. So let's make it simple. We're undergoing a lot of terminology change because mainly driven by human medicine, we're realizing that the nature and how we do these scans has changed. The terminology that most of us are familiar with is FAST, which stands for Focus Assessment with Sonography for Trauma. And people have expanded this for triage and tracking, which is great. But at the end of the day, I, I love what they've embraced in human medicine. It's point of care or bedside or cage side. So point of care, you're next to the patient. And I think, honestly, that, that captures it a little bit better. So I, I prefer point of care ultrasound or focus exams, but for the audience, they're all the same thing. So the standardized technique that's been validated in veterinary medicine based on humans is a four point technique. And again, terminology is vastly reported. There are different words reported for the four sites. I'm going to use what I kind of love, which are easier to remember, but I'll give both. Uh, first location, is going to be the subxiphoid, um, also called the diaphragmatico-hepatic. Um, the second is going to be the paralumbar of the flank, also called the splenorenal. Third is going to be the bladder, also called the cystocolic. And then the fourth is going to be on midline or just off it if they're on their side. Um, I call it the umbilicus, but it's also called the hepatorenal. But it's kind of misnamed now because we don't look for liver and we don't look for right kidney when you're down there. And then what is the classic ultrasound appearance of the majority of GI foreign bodies? Yeah. So since we're segueing out of point of care, one of the things I want to, I guess, drive home is that point of care has a strong role for suspected obstructions to look for abnormal fluid uh, that could be associated with gastric perforation and septic peritonitis. It's also pretty accurate at diagnosing free gas. To date, unfortunately, point of care has not been validated to accurately diagnose obstructions. And I know I'll hear people go, oh, well, I'm an emergency clinician and I diagnose them with point of care all the time. You're not doing point of care anymore. You're doing a limited single organ diagnostic ultrasound. So we may get there. We may develop a three, four, five point system to look for an obstruction. But at this time, I do like to think of them separate. So when we look at diagnostic ultrasound's ability to find an obstruction, here's the good news. You're looking for the same thing that we just talked about on RADS. You're just seeing it in a different way. You're seeing the cross-sectional anatomy. So for the pyloric outflow track, you're able to see the actual pyloric outflow track and you're looking for a structure in it. You're looking for, is the stomach big? If it's gas-filled, it's just it's going to be big and push stuff around. You'll only see one wall layer of it. Then you get to pylorus and you're looking for a structure in it. For uh, small bowel obstruction, you're looking for bowel loops that are big and filled with fluid and gas and ones that are not. And then most of the time you can find the foreign body and where it transitions from dilation to normal. For linear, you're looking for plication with a hyperchoic cloth, ribbon, something going through it. Um, and often they anchor in the pylorus. The big difference is on radiographs, we can see the opacity of the structure. If it's bone, it's, it's mineral opaque, et cetera. On foreign body, the really confused or ultrasound, the thing that confuses a lot of people is that most foreign bodies are going to be less visible. 
meaning because there's a change in, in tissue density and the speed of sound, you will see a hyperechoic surface and then shadowing. You won't see the complete foreign body. You only see the surface of it. So if you're in the pyloric outflow track and you see a curved linear hyperechoic line with a shadow, that's probably a ball or a toy. Occasionally we get lucky. Some foreign bodies like potatoes transmit sound. So you'll see the whole thing or a squeaker toy filled with gastric fluid. It will transmit and you'll see the whole thing. Um, big wads of meat. I've seen animals like swallow like a whole steak and it obstructs. You'll see through that. But most of the time you're looking for surface and shadowing below it, clean shadowing usually, unless it has gas and it'll be a dirty shadow. When you have something in the pylorus, are there any positioning tricks that you can use in order to help better visualize that area with your ultrasound? Yeah. So let's start with how most people probably scan, which is an animal laying on their back, right? They're in dorsal recumbency mm -hmm. and you're approaching the pylorus from subxiphoid. In, in a lot of bigger dogs, you will not see the pylorus from subxiphoid. So the next trick is to come around to their right lateral body wall and do um, an intercostal approach in transverse. Um, I'll play around in this area. I would say 95% of the time, if I didn't see it from subxiphoid, I will see it intercostally. It's wonderful. You can also see pancreatic body, vessels, gallbladder, and all sorts of other stuff from this intercostal approach as well. In the rare dog where you still can't see it, and it will happen, then you let gravity be your friend, and the rule is put them in any position you can try. I will then take them out of dorsal, and I'll put them in left lateral so their right side is up. And sometimes body and fundus will fall away and pylorus is there. Then if that doesn't work, I stand them up and I try an intercostal approach and try my subxiphoid. So sometimes I oblique them and I do 45. Uh, so the big thing is just keep moving. Know that that's the benefit of ultrasound. You're, you can change things real time and watch how it changes on your screen. So start on their back, move to left lateral, stand them up, you're really not going to put them in right lateral because then the pylorus is down, but try all three of those positions and then you finally give up. And hopefully you haven't, but if you're truly worried about the pylorus and you haven't gotten rads, go get your left lateral projection. Hopefully you did that, but if not, go get your left lateral. And then we spoke a little bit before the break about, you, you talked about the usefulness and really the limitations of those calculations of intestinal diameter when we're mm -hmm. talking about radiography. Um, are there more predictive measurements that can be obtained when we're using our ultrasound? Yes, yes. So this is, again, this number that I'm going to give you is based on a single study, to my knowledge. Uh, I don't know if anybody's replicated. But in the study that sort of established that ultrasound was really accurate, like 97% and more accurate than RADS, what they found is that when small bowel diameter exceeded 1.5 centimeters, um, regardless of body weight, it was highly predictive of small bowel obstruction. Now there are a couple of keys to this. All right. One, it has to be segmental dilation. I have seen dogs that are diffusely dilated and it's just really bad functional ileus and it goes just above that cutoff. All right. Two, it's just a number, right? If I have a great Dane and they're 1.6 and nothing else is really checking a box, I may ignore it. If it's a cat and it's 1.4 and it's horribly segmentally dilated, I, I may count it. So where that where that number can be helpful is that if you don't see a foreign body because it's hiding somewhere, you can still make the call of presumptive obstruction if you see segmental dilation where the segmentally dilated loops are greater than 1.5. And for those in our audience who may not ultrasound a lot, just make certain you're measuring true diameter, which is measured serosa to serosa. A lot of us are used to measuring thickness, which is lumen to serosa, that's only half of it. This number is referring to serosa to serosa, a full diameter measurement. That's a really important distinction. Thank you. And then you kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier, but um, when you were talking about how plication, you know, looks, how those linear form bodies look, but do you, is there a very reliable way to really distinguish plication just from normal peristalsis when we're looking with our ultrasound? 
Mm, great question. So let's talk about peristalsis versus corrugation versus plication, and let's reverse that order. All right, for a minute, plication, which is what we're all concerned about, is where you have that abnormal bunching together. And the big thing that is going to look different is the serosal margin is going to tightly undulate. You're going to get these really, really tight hairpin turns, and it's going to go back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. Sometimes it plicates so bad, it actually gets hard to distinguish where the bowel's ending and beginning. It, it can look like a mess, but the big key is the serosa is involved with the undulation. You see undulation to the serosal margin itself. When we compare that to corrugation, corrugation is irritation of the bowel that forms an undulant surface, but it's undulant along the mucosal margin and the lumen. You know, The serosa we find is intact, so you have this nice straight hypercoke serosa and undulating mucosa and submucosa. So it's going to be corrugation. Um, just normal peristalsis are going to be these nice relaxed curves, and that's the key. They're relaxed. They're not really, really tight together. And the other key, they're going to move. So if you hold your transducer on it, the the peristalsis will change to another location, and then you'll be left with the straight segment again. Wonderful. So that kind of brings me towards the end of the questions that I had, you know, regarding radiography as well as ultrasonography when looking at foreign bodies. This has been um, highly, highly educational, and I'm excited to try some of these techniques. Um, we, you did talk a little bit about how ultrasound is, you know, takes longer and definitely is more expensive, you know, compared to standard abdominal radiography. Um, so do you, it's just before we wrap up, is there really any scenario where it's more practical to jump straight to an ultrasound and skip those radiographs or, or do you really always want those radiographs done first? No, that's actually an excellent point. The one reliable uh, situation where you can get a free pass to skip is if you've done point of care or physical exam and you know there's a tremendous amount of free fluid in that belly. Um, even just with our puppies, I still like rads because often you see some serosal detail, especially with digital radiography, and you can still see that gas pattern and you get to appreciate stomach, etc. Um, the other is if you're worried your obstruction with your peritoneal fusion is chronic and maybe you have a neoplastic etiology or an infectious etiology. In those cases, we'll, we'll go ahead and skip because it, at the heart of it, we don't think it's going to be a, a valued study. It's not going to provide us information that helps move the case along. Uh, the other situation that I think it's important to comment on, if you diagnose obstruction on your RADs, is there a reason to do an ultrasound? And I see confusion over this. Um, I'll have patients where, you know, well-meaning vet, they'll make the diagnosis. They'll say obstructed needs ultrasound. And I would say in most situations, if you confidently make the call on radiographs and you are fairly confident it's a foreign body, go in. You do not need an ultrasound. The situation where you may need an ultrasound is that older patient and you are concerned that there might be something worse causing it other than a foreign body. For example, cancer, and the owner's like, you know what, if you find a big tumor, I don't want it cut out. In those situations, I think it's very fair to ultrasound, even if we know the answer, uh, to give the owner the best information to make the best decision for their pet. That is an excellent, excellent point. I have definitely seen some older animals um, that have come in with foreign body because they've had pica because they feel bad because of their cancer. Yeah. Um, I've yeah. had that happen to me more than once in my career. And and so that's a, a good point to keep in mind when you're faced with those um, patients mm -hmm. that, you know, like you said, are maybe a little older, never ever had a history of chewing up toys or anything like that when they were younger. Yeah. And Alyssa, I do want to stress, I know there will be audience members who are phenomenal ultrasound and they will, you know, probably come in or write, Hey, I go straight to ultrasound and I'm great at it. And for those situations, wonderful. I will have radiologist colleagues who say the same and I'll say wonderful. Um, again, the perspective, hopefully everybody's hearing, I'm working from the perspective of the average general practitioner who has none to moderate ultrasound experience 
And also the average situation where ultrasound is three to four times as much as radiographs, or let's just say two to three times, where radiographs still have a very valuable role and can help a lot of patients without moving on. But are there going to be situations where maybe I wouldn't do an ultrasound and somebody would, and the pet still gets treated 100%, and that's the art and beauty of veterinary medicine. So if you're jumping straight to ultrasound and it's working, great for you. Um, we we still at state do rads first because we've been burnt going straight to ultrasound. And I just, I love being able to save clients money. I do. Excellent. Well, before I let you go, then there's just one more thing that we do at the end of our episodes. We okay. play a little game. It's a, a kind of a series of <laughs> would you rather questions. It's just oh, for okay. fun. Do you want to play? We're safe. Yes, yeah. uh, I am more than happy. Okay. I thought you were going to quiz Excellent. me and I was going to get intimidated. <laughs> no, we're we're done with the highly intellectual things. This is just I for love fun. it. <laughs> What's ironic, my daughter's okay. eight and she's playing this game a lot at the dinner table. So we play Would You Rather on a weekly basis. So this will be fun. Uh, oh, my gosh, you're going to be a natural. <laughs> well, let's get yeah. started. If you were setting up a practice on a remote desert island and you could only bring one, would you bring your x-ray machine or would you bring your ultrasound? 100% radiographs. All yeah. right. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, if you had to place, um, would you rather place an IV in a dehydrated kitten or in an obese basset hound? Oh. <laughs> I'm actually going to go dehydrated kitten. Does it does it count if I like wow. to go intraosseous? Does it count if I like to go I knew you were going to say that. Be <laughs> yes, because you're you're a ER, ER clinician. I knew you were going to No, you have to place a peripheral okay. IV. <laughs> obese. Obese facet. And we're just going to pull out our ultrasound and guide it that way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to cheat. Either way, I'm cheating. I'm either going in trust or, 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 <laughs> or doing ultrasound guided. Okay. If you had to swap places with one of your students for the day, would you rather be a freshman and sit in lectures all day or would you rather be an upperclassman on the overnight ICU rotation? Oh, easy for me. Uh, overnight ICU. Believe it or not, though, I'm a nerd, so clo much. close second. I do love my my lectures, but you said ICU, so I'm going for it. If you had said another okay. specialty, and I'm not going to name it because I don't want to get in trouble, I would have picked lecture. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we won't get anybody in trouble today. Don't give me in trouble. Um, if they could both rate you on Yelp, would you rather you get a review from your last feline patient or from your last canine patient? Oh, like the actual patient? Uh -huh. um, I'm going to go my last feline patient uh, because my last canine patient was a non-cooperative chihuahua who did not like me. So I think the feline okay. would have been a lot happier with me. <laughs> Your chihuahua is like 10 out of 10, do not recommend. <laughs> It, it did not want its echocardiogram and it very much objective and needed sedated after uh, some struggle time. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, poor baby. I know. Okay. Well, actually, that's great. That's perfect for our last question. So this okay. is the last question. This is the most mm -hmm. important. So I want you to give yeah. us some thought. Uh, if, if a centaur came into you and was complaining of exercise intolerance, would you ultrasound the human heart or would you ultrasound the heart in the, the horse's thorax? I am going to go with the human heart because uh, equine cardiac disease is very uncommon. And I would argue much less common than human cardiac disease. I think that's a fantastic answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was it. See, it wasn't so yeah. bad. No, that was really fun. I like it. I'll have to tell my daughter. She will be <laughs> thrilled that daddy got to play Would You Rather at work. I think that it's wonderful that your daughter likes to play this game at home because my kids like yeah. to play it too. So it's fun. 
Well, thank you again so much for taking the time to sit down with us. This was wonderful. To all of our listeners at home, thank you for joining us. And we hope that you'll join us in the future for some more conversations. Alyssa, it was a delight. Thank you for having me. And to all my colleagues on the front lines, thank you for what you do. Thank you all for listening to today's episode of Clinicians Brief, the podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, you can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts, including a video version that we have on YouTube. While you're there, make sure you subscribe, rate, and review us. You can also listen to or watch our podcast episodes on our website at cliniciansbrief.com slash podcasts. Or if you'd like, drop us a line at podcasts at vetmedics.com. Clinicians Brief the Podcast is a VetMedics production produced by Alexis Ussery and hosted by me, Dr. Alyssa Watson.